stand up South Africa. Make sure that South Africa, you are counted with me. Run South Africa. Stand and make sure that our people understand that the need to be revolution in South Africa is guaranteed that under the EFF, this country will be the better. EFF is a cover thing. Rishile Africa Zonga, Africa Namsaba Nkwayo. My name is Titus Tsungu and I bring you this week's edition of the EFF podcast from Winnie Matigizela Mandela House. As we gravitate towards the seventh administration of the Democratic South Africa, uh, we want to understand what kind of government does South Africans uh, really deserve and whether the 2024 elections would usher in such government. We have in studio a political commentator and the author of No White Lies, uh, that is a political uh, analyst, uh, Kim Hiller. A very good morning to you and welcome to the EFF podcast. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be with you today. Thank you, pleasure. Now, your political views are unequivocally aligned with the politics of the left. One thinks or one wonders why do you care so much about black people because mostly when I listen to you you talk about the plight of uh, you know black people, the poor and the marginalized. Well, um perhaps to introduce myself i always yeah. describe describe myself as a white settler as oh, okay. a, as a true foreigner in the country yeah and perhaps we can look at that later you know this dreadful concept mm-hmm. and practice mm-hmm. of african brothers and sisters turning on african brothers and sisters mm-hmm. so i'm being interviewed today still as a settler yeah. still as a privileged white person mm-hmm. in what we call a democratic south africa but which is certainly not democratic mm-hmm. So uh perhaps when I look at what my forefathers did to this country mm-hmm. I feel it's incumbent upon me to try and rectify some of the brutal acts of great inhumanity mm-hmm. conducted by people like me against black South Africans. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a matter of justice of standing for justice here uh, of also being quite vocal on the Palestine issue. Mm-hmm. So I think to be a human being is to speak about justice wherever you see it. Yeah. Sadly what we see is that white South Africans don't seem to have any moral compass. Mm-hmm. So people like myself we've never offered reparations. We've never um be- uh, knelt down before black people and said forgive me for mm-hmm. the great atrocities I've committed not under not only under apartheid but under colonialism. Mm-hmm. So I think why I've written no white lies and about white the lack of white um accountability uh is because I'm trying to appeal to white people to shift their national consciousness from one of privilege and mm-hmm. white supremacy and entitlement and arrogance and I can go on a lot yes to actually say recognize the sins that you've committed mm-hmm. in this country whether it's through you or the actions of those that came before you mm-hmm. and uh the you speak about national reconciliation mm-hmm. but white people aren't interested in reconciliation mm. that's very sad and how are you being treated in the white community for your political stance that you have taken well as I a think, white person yeah yeah i think i've always been a black sheep in the community and although i've written i mean i've written um i've said to letters I've written I've been on television mm-hmm. and I've said dear white fellow South Africans it's mm-hmm. time for us to give back the land it's mm-hmm. time for us to repent for the things that we've done because only when we do that mm-hmm. can we speak about a stronger together nation mm-hmm. can we speak about reconciliation mm-hmm. and uh, generally what I get is a lot of hate mail which is disappointing so I've come to the conclusion sadly so mm-hmm. that um white people are not going to participate in the emancipation of South Africa in fact they'll do everything um to make sure that this land is never transformed mm-hmm. they are holding on to stolen goods mm-hmm. and uh so uh, yes possibly i'm seen as the enemy of whiteness uh, i'm seen as a, a a race traitor but i actually wear that label very proudly mm-hmm. because if being a race uh, traitor means um trying to bring an equitable and just society mm-hmm. then you can label me that any day mm. and when we talk about issues of um 
racism, they are still rife in, in South Africa. Given the, the state of uh, racism or the rate at which it happens in South Africa, would you say South Africa is a rainbow nation? South Africa, if South Africa is a rainbow nation, then the rainbow nation must be a very big storm, actually. Mm -hmm. And I think we did a great disservice to this country and to mm -hmm. black South Africans and in, in a way white South Africans in 1994. Mm -hmm. And in my book, I write about how uh, reconciliation is actually a white man's medicine. Mm -hmm. It has done a lot of harm to black people. Mm -hmm. uh, it may not have been intended to cause harm, mm -hmm. but it has done no healing. So what we saw in 1994 was black liberation put on the back burner. In fact, in my book, I speak about a stillborn democracy. And I think 1994 took uh, emphasis, emphasis off the black struggle in what I call this absolute nonsense of non-racialism. Mm -hmm. I'm not an advocate of non-racialism. Mm -hmm. I describe myself quite proudly as a former charterist where this coming together of white people and black people mm -hmm. is seen as such a wonderful thing. I don't think it is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. We cannot speak about reconciliation mm -hmm. until we speak about being equal partners. Mm -hmm. And as it stands now, I'm a white privileged person and black people are still children of a lesser God mm -hmm. in what we would call a democratic government mm -hmm. and under what we would we once thought was a black government. Mm -hmm. But the ANC is is day by day showing itself as a government that stands for the interests of whiteness rather than the dignity of mm -hmm. the black child. Mm -hmm. And what do you think is the reason behind white supremacy? Why do we still have white people who still believe that they are more superior than black people in South Africa? You know, white supremacy is a, it's actually a very long, we could call marketing campaign it's been going on for 300 years, centuries, mm -hmm. not only in South Africa, but across mm -hmm. the world. And uh, white people have used the notion mm -hmm. of being superior to conquer, unfairly so, other countries, other races. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a strategy that works for white people because mm -hmm. it allows white mediocrity to trump over black uh, excellence mm -hmm. time and time again. We see that in a party like the DA, where we have the oh, most yeah. ridiculously uneducated and quite stupid man, John Steenhuisen. But when you look at some of the black women who competed against him, mm -hmm. they were actually outstanding uh, achievers, mm -hmm. very strong, well-educated, uh, knowledgeable and well-traveled uh, mm -hmm. black women. But they didn't stand a chance. Mm -hmm. So in, still in South Africa, we have the mantra of do not disturb white supremacy and white privilege. Mm -hmm. And what's so remarkable is that the that the ANC government seemed to have adopted that. I almost feel it's like the the war the the national anthem of the ANC. Yeah. Not to disturb white white mm -hmm. supremacy. Mm -hmm. So it's not even about I mean white people will always act in their own interests. Mm -hmm. History tells us that no white person anywhere in the world, no government mm -hmm. has ever handed over power um, willingly. Mm -hmm. So we have white people who are holding on to whatever oh, yeah. they have. But sadly, we have a black government mm -hmm. who's allowing them so. We also have an older black generation mm -hmm. that I think has subs almost subscribes to the notion that white people are superior. And that's where the tragedy lies, not in white people thinking they're better. I mean, we know that's a, that's a false dogma, yeah. but it breaks my heart when we see black people buying into that notion. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it, 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 we see that in everyday life where black people will go into a white supermarket, white people, uh, black people will consume white media, although the images of black people mm -hmm. in mainstream media mm -hmm. are shocking. Uh, bla black people are criminalized. They're seen as poor family representatives. You know, they've always, they've always been put down not only in South Africa, you mm -hmm. see that in the US, yes. but yet black people will still go to white media first. They'll still go to white banks. And I think that's a very sad symptom of the power of white supremacy. And that's what I write about, mm -hmm. is that uh, black people have fallen under mm -hmm. this. What is encouraging to me 
as I look at, uh, I, I speak as an old white gogo, <laughs> I, uh, but when I look at organizations like yeah. the EFF mm-hmm. and other young organizations, I see that th- that is falling. White supremacy is frowned upon. We finally met a generation of black South Africans who are saying, no, 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 not mm-hmm. in my name. Yes. Will I put up with such nonsense? Mm-hmm. I'm a confident black young person mm-hmm. and the time has come for us to to rule, to dominate, to assume mm-hmm. our cultural dominance, our intellectual superiority. Mm-hmm. And that's a beautiful time. I hope I see that in my lifetime. Mm-hmm. And indeed, white uh, supremacy is unfathomable. Looking at the EFF uh, stance, uh, looking at the seven non-negotiable pillars, uh, do you strongly believe that land indeed should be expropriated without compensation? Without question. I mean, that is the first pillar. In fact, if Mm -hmm. we don't have land justice, every single other pillar will follow. Mm -hmm. And um, I've often said the best way to humble whiteness Mm-hmm. which is very arrogant, is to take away land, which doesn't belong to us, actually. Uh, but a people cannot be economically viable. They cannot be economically in flourish without land. The dignity mm-hmm. of the black child is dependent on land. Land is more than an economic entity. It speaks mm-hmm. to the soul of a, of a people. So that has to happen. And I've, I mean, it's so disappointing that the ANC has been so reluctant Mm -hmm. to hand back land, but it tells us a lot. And I must say, just to speak about a personal experience, I was invited, strangely enough, to the ANC Land Summit in 2017, I think. Mm -hmm. And I was quite appalled at the level of discussion that took place there. They Mm -hmm. tended to bring in white experts. When we were finally writing critical papers Uh, The scribes, once again, were whites. Uh, So the ANC accorded a lot of uh, status to white people speaking about land, which is actually quite ridiculous Mm -hmm. because we are land thieves. Um, So what I think in in the discussion of land, and I've written about this, is that land return must happen without white people. The fact that there's consultation with white people, the land thieves, is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. A bold government would have just taken land back, actually. Mm -hmm. And all land, not only land for economic rights, but land for justice, Mm -hmm. to try and make right some of the historical abuse and genocide, really, that took place when land was stolen from black people. Mm -hmm. You talked about the DA being uh, a party that obviously peddles or it peddles uh, or fuels uh, racism in some parts. Now we understand that in the Western Cape, the DA wants uh, the provincial powers bill. Uh, what do you make of the, the DA's position on that? Well, I mean, the DA, I've written before about mm-hmm. the, the oxygen of the DA is white supremacy and white privilege. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can't take out that from... It's, it's like part of their DNA, actually. It's, it's, they mm-hmm. can't breathe without racism. So, you know, once again, they just want to extract more and more. Mm-hmm. You would think that at this stage there would be some level of desire for equity and um, sharing of assets, mm-hmm. but they just want more and more. And the notion of this Cape independence, oh, yeah. I mean, it's just absolutely, it's, that is a explicit example of uh, whiteness unable to confront itself mm. and say, let us share South Africa. We should be grateful as white people that we're still allowed on this land. Mm-hmm. But what do we do? We just want to take not only the land, but mm-hmm. an entire province. And it's quite interesting just to look at this in an con- international context mm-hmm. where we see the people of Palestine in the same situation that we have apartheid Israel mm-hmm. wanting more and more more land. Mm-hmm. So both struggles in a way are colonial struggles. And what we see in South Africa and in Israel, because there's also settlers in that area, which doesn't belong to them, we see the, rem- the, the, the presence, mm-hmm. the omnipresence, in fact, mm-hmm. of the colonizer in society. So the DA is a... A colonial party, 
Uh, it subscribes to uh, white supremacy. Mm-hmm. But sadly, it also represents the mindset of most white South Africans who don't think differently. Mm-hmm. Do you think the DA is um, helping in ending racism? I mean, there are many incidents of racism uh, where the DA is mom not issuing a statement or taking an action. Now in Limpopo and Kroblasdal, if you have seen that, uh, there was a white um, uh, farmer, white man, Boers, who were flying uh, the you know uh, Boer Republic flag uh, after they were appearing in court. What needs to happen to, to sort of nip these anomalies in the bud? That's a really good question. And mm-hmm. I think the answer is quite complex. Mm-hmm. So we see racism every single day. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a serial thing. That just happens to be a grotesque example mm-hmm. of racism. But racism is the water we drink. It's everywhere. It's mm-hmm. in the air that we breathe. Mm-hmm. Perhaps not in this beautiful building named after one of our greatest um, struggle mm-hmm. heroes, mm-hmm. Winnie Mandela. Mm-hmm. But um, outside of possibly the, the EFF and some other progressive organizations, mm-hmm. racism is everywhere. And we can't expect the DA to end it or issue statements about that because it fuels their growth. They can't survive without the ember of racism. But where I think we as South Africans have to take responsibility mm-hmm. is, well, particularly the ANC, which has been the most dismal ruling party. I was a member of the ANC in 1994, mm-hmm. and I can't believe how poorly they've managed the country but mostly because they took a racist system and they didn't make any adjustments to it. Mm -hmm. So today we have the the architecture of apartheid. The ecosystem of everything that we do is based on uh, apartheid colonialism. Mm -hmm. And the ANC could have made changes, but what did they do? They just kept that system intact. They just allowed the, the black man and the black woman to be accommodated in the system, Mm -hmm. to have a small place at the table. Mm -hmm. And so today we have crumbs for the black person Mm -hmm. where the large share of the pie still is with the white colonial settler Mm -hmm. like myself. Mm -hmm. So racism is in the system itself. And so I'm less concerned about the, the, on the daily racism. I mean, that obviously I'm not, it's a dreadful thing. Mm-hmm. But until we tra- we tackle this systemically uh, and eradicate racist um, structures of the economy, of uh, cultural expression, of the narrative itself that we speak every day, um, nothing's going to change. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, where I see a lot of racism that worries me is in the schools, for instance. Oh, like brick and where, yeah, yeah, but but even more so than that, yeah. I think it's what we... what. Children are taught. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I I had the great pleasure many years ago, I was working at the Sowetan, and I worked with Don Matero, who was one of the greatest poets in this country. Mm-hmm. And his work is beautiful. To me, he is a true black consciousness leader. Oh, yeah. And uh, when his work was uh, suggested for grade one learners, the um, Department of Education said, no, we can't feature his work. Mm-hmm because it could upset white children. So these are real issues that we are accommodating the former settler uh, and making him feel so comfortable that by doing so, uh, the black South African, the African, is absolutely put on the peripheries of an economy, of a cultural um, landscape mm-hmm. that is his and hers, but which is, no, which is completely contaminated by whiteness. Mm-hmm. So that, you know, th- that to me is a real expression of racism that in our, in the schools, black thought, black expression uh, cannot be fully articulated. I think that's, that's, that's really painful. Mm-hmm. Do you believe there are schools that uh, preserve the legacy of uh, apartheid in the form of racism? I think that what happened was that, yes, but the schools are part of a larger system. Mm-hmm. So I think there is a problem. I mean, even in a, a lot of the modern Model C type schools, mm-hmm. you know, we see African languages still pushed to the side as an option. Oh. And that's a real problem. Mm-hmm. Um, I did a, 
seminar at one of the universities a few years ago, and I said the two things that I think a black government should do would be to, first of all, take land from white people because it was stolen and white people are not the rightful owners. And the second thing I would do is to stop speaking the language of the settler, English and Afrikaans, mm -hmm. and um, put at the center African languages. Because imagine if we're having this conversation not in English. Oh, yeah. Imagine if we were having critical discussions in our country and our president spoke in an African language. Mm -hmm. White people would immediately lose power. At the same time, there would be a, a, uh, an expression mm -hmm. of uh, being African. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, our society is very damaged. The Rainbow Nation has just caused more discomfort, not less discomfort. And uh, I always think, like, I, I get so shocked when I see people singing destem. I mean, black professors standing up and mm -hmm. saying, you know, singing this, this apartheid melody. Mm. I mean, that's so painful that we're having that. I wonder what young people think. So it, it's more than just even a structural recalibration of society. It's a cultural recalibration. Mm -hmm. It's to say this is our voice. We've been, the white voice must be shut down or quietened. What are the values of an indigenous black society? And let's get back to that. Mm -hmm. That's what will end racism. Mm -hmm. Because when you talk about the STEM, uh, the EFF, as you may have noticed, during its rallies and events, it sings uh, pro-African, you know, you know pan-Africanist, uh, you know, uh, anthem, national anthem, which doesn't include uh, the stem. Now you have lobby groups like Afri Forum. You have African uh, cultural groups that defend, um, you know, white supremacy and racism. What do you think should happen to those organizations? And do do we blame the constitution? Must we amend the constitution to allow for you know a non-racial South Africa where black people also feel you know, represented and also empowered? I mean, I find it quite absurd that mm -hmm. in our so-called democracy, we have a racist organization, mm -hmm. every forum. I mean, it's a public protector of whiteness. Mm -hmm. And then we speak about them as a civil rights group. That's absolute nonsense. They are a racist organization. They are fueled by white supremacy. Mm -hmm. They are going across the world, including, um, well, America is in the world, perhaps, but um, <laughs> that's a debate, perhaps, of its yeah. own accord. <laughs> but uh, fueling mm -hmm. uh, an agenda of white genocide, I do a lot of international interviews, and I'm always asked mm -hmm. about this white genocide that is taking place. So it's a very destructive group. And I often think I wrote today about the Cape independence, and mm -hmm. my feeling was, you know, if white people are so unhappy in this country, then they must just leave. If they stay there, must accept that this is not their country and they must fit into the rules set by the majority government. Mm -hmm. But every forum operate as if they are the ruling party. And the ruling party is so weak mm -hmm. that it just allows them to do whatever they want. And that's what I look forward to, seeing an EFF government, because an EFF government will not tolerate that. An EFF government will not tolerate racism. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will celebrate that day. Mm -hmm. What do you make of Orania, where only white people live there? Well, I mean, it's also being allowed. But in, in one way, we have to commend white people because they look after their own interests mm -hmm. very well. It's like the state of Israel. You know, mm -hmm. they look after their own people but are greatly uh, unjust against people of other races or other types. So Orania... Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a bastion of, of uh, self-sufficiency. I mean, it does bring into the, the, the question at least the Afrikaners have established an element of self-determination, which mm -hmm. has not happened in um, the Rainbow Nation more generally. I mean, mm -hmm. we, have a, we can't even produce anything in this country. Mm -hmm. So perhaps there's some interesting learnings from the Afrikaans nationalist type of exclusive society not mm -hmm. that I support that, of course. It's a vile concept. Mm -hmm. But it, but they, for their own people, they are establishing self-determination. And there's some lesson where um, we are still, as South Africa and Africa, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. so dependent mm-hmm. on the West. Mm-hmm. Don't you think uh, establishment of such areas like Orania perpetuates uh, white supremacy and, of course, uh, some sort of uh, a federal state? Yes, it does. And I think that's the view of the Cape Independence Movement now, Mm -hmm. where they want to secede almost a whole province away from South Africa. Mm -hmm. I mean, interestingly, the same, very same province that colonialism entered through. Um, But I think white supremacy is everywhere. I think it's in the boardrooms. I think it's in parliament. I think it's in the judiciary. It's in the newspapers that we consume. It's everywhere. I don't think it has to be locked up and uh, isolated in an Arania. It is everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, it's in the choices that we are forced to make. I mean, the economy is primarily white. The land is white. And more importantly, perhaps, is the thinking in our society is still driven by white values mm-hmm. and a white ideology. And that's once again where I celebrate the the birth of an organization such as the EFF, mm-hmm. which is challenging that. It's a, it's introducing beautiful ideologies of Fanon, of Sankara, of uh, Steve Biko, mm-hmm. um, so that we can start reimagining mm-hmm. a new future, a future where white supremacy is, if not eradicated, uh, pushed to the peripheries mm-hmm. of the society in every aspect. Mm-hmm. When did your interest in politics actually start? Was your family somewhat uh, influential in your political uh, consciousness growing up in a white family? I I was born into a very quite conservative Jewish family, actually. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've been a rebel for as long as I can remember it. I've always been, I can't remember a time I wasn't pro-Palestinian and also uh, against... Um, what I saw, but I mean, the, the the white system of indoctrination at school was very strong. Mm-hmm. I think when I became aware of of the injustice was when a family friend, um, Dr. Edelstein, he was actually a doctor in Soweto, mm-hmm. and he was one of the people who lost his life in the Soweto riots in 1976. Mm-hmm. So I was a very young child, I think I was 10 or 11. And I think that allowed me to understand a little bit more about the country Mm -hmm. uh, outside of the white suburbs to which was my world, to try and understand what was going on in the nation. And Mm -hmm. I think from that moment on, I never saw the world in the Mm -hmm. same way. Um, But yeah, I haven't come from a family who supports my political views Mm -hmm. and nor do I support their political ideology. Yeah. So with that, background, what was motivating you to go ahead to be a rebel, like you describe yourself? What was giving you the edge to, in fact, uh, you know, go out and advocate for those who are pr- oppressed? Well, I think it just comes comes down to justice. I was um, an activist at Wits University. In fact, I met the wonderful um, advocate Dalim Pofo at that time, mm-hmm. uh, I was at university a long time ago mm-hmm. where there were still black structures and white structures. And uh, we did a lot of uh, protesting under the state of emergency, still apartheid, good old days. Mm-hmm. And I think I was motivated by individuals that I met, um, many of, of who are quite senior leaders now, um, but particularly by somebody like uh, Advocate Mpofo, who even in those days, Everyone loved him on university, from the cleaners, from the security people, from the students. Mm -hmm. He was a true activist and I think a wonderful role model. And uh, actually when he joined EFF from the ANC, because I'd also been an ANC member, I knew Mm -hmm. it was time for me Mm -hmm. to join the EFF, which I did in 2014. Mm -hmm. But I think to be inspired by people of that um, caliber, I think had a very significant impact on my life. Mm And we're grateful to have uh, people like you uh, who have got strong views in the discourse and because we, we, we need uh, thought leaders, we need people who are going to stand up. At least now you are a white person, but you are standing up for justice, not because you're white, you're privileged, and you, you let those who are less uh, privileged uh, fend for themselves. Now, you talked about... Uh, joining the EFF. I understand that in 2014 you served in the EFF in Trim 
PCT structure in Gauteng. And uh, you were subsequently elected as the first uh, uh, deputy secretary in Gauteng. Talk us through your role in the EFF and why did you decide to join the, the Red Beret? Well, as I said, I think being motivated when I remember, I'll never forget the words of mm -hmm. uh, Darling Popo when he said, um, I didn't leave the ANC, it left me. And I had been a loyal member of the ANC mm -hmm. until Marikana, and that shook me. I couldn't understand that mm -hmm. a black government would do this. Uh, you know, you expect nothing of white people um, killing and maiming black people, but when a black government does that, mm -hmm. it's just, it, 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 my love affair with the NC ended mm -hmm. and uh, to see somebody like Andile join the EFF I knew that at last mm -hmm. there was a party mm -hmm. that I could join that there were, that was an alternative to the EF, to the ANC mm -hmm. and I did join and I was very blessed to work with um, some of the senior leaders including the CIC mm -hmm. it was an absolute privilege actually mm -hmm. I met people who were the whole leadership was just brilliant. I mean, for people to say Julius Malema is not intelligent and educated, I found one of the most intelligent people I've met. Mm -hmm. um, Floyd, of course, he used to set us very hard exams, and mostly, <laughs> I, mostly I failed. Yeah. Actually, you know, in terms of you have to be very versed in in um, so many ideologies, from Marxism to Fanon. Yeah, to it yeah. was just, it was really a big. Uh, mm -hmm. um, ideological and intellectual uh, mm -hmm. lesson for me to be part of EFF. Mm -hmm. And I'm very grateful. Also having worked with the, I was allocated uh, Alex during the election. and Oh, Alexandra, yeah. Yeah, it was just um, mm -hmm. a wonderful experience. Um, I have so much respect for ordinary fighters. Actually, mm -hmm. I'm more so even than the leadership, the, the quality and dedication of EFF. EFA fighters I've never seen in any other organization. Mm -hmm. So I was very fortunate to be part of the, the 2014 election. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I had joined at a time when it was still early days in the EFF mm -hmm. and there was no formal structures. And I remember um, the CRC allocated people to be in the interim structure of which I was part. Mm -hmm. And I remember his dedication to ensuring that there was an equal balance of males and females, oh, yeah. and I always found that very admirable because mm -hmm. he stuck he st he stuck to that not mm -hmm. only in interim structures but in the placing of people in the national assembly, in allocating positions to people. He mm -hmm. was very sincere yeah. in that. Mm -hmm. And you talked about the CIC, his character, and also labeling him as one of the best politicians in South Africa. Why? I think that he's a man of the people. I mm -hmm. think he understands poverty. I mm -hmm. think he understands racism mm -hmm. and being suppressed and having a very difficult life. Mm -hmm. So I think he's one of the leaders who stayed true to serving the people. And I think that is a very outstanding characteristic to have in a country where most leaders have abandoned that. So I've I've spoken about how the ANC, the greatest act of social distancing in this country, mm -hmm. was between the ANC and the electorate. They've abandoned their people. Mm -hmm. And I believe that um, Malema will, I think he'll stand with his people to the bitter end. Mm -hmm. um, I also think he's an outstanding leader in the sense that he's driven a united Africa perspective. Oh, yes. Absolutely. And I think that's a mark of a man who is leading not only for today, but for tomorrow. And I think the significance of the EFF and Julius Malema will only be felt in generations to come because there's no bigger gift that you can give to an African child than a mm -hmm. united Africa. Mm -hmm. And whilst I see some people are skeptical about the, the policy of mm -hmm. the, well, the open borders policy of the EFF, I think it's one of the most progressive strategies mm -hmm. that uh, I've seen. And um, people in the diaspora, people on the continent appreciate that. Mm -hmm. The um, share of voice that EFF has internationally and on the continent mm -hmm. is far greater mm -hmm. than I think anyone realizes in South Africa. Mm -hmm. I think it's a mark of an organization 
that is going to be not only a force in South Africa, mm -hmm. but internationally and, of course, most importantly, mm -hmm. on the continent. Yeah. And, of course, the EFF is an organization with an international uh, internationalist outlook. And the CIC has always been traveling the length and breadth of Africa and is mostly warmly received. Uh, recently, he was in uh, Ghana and mm -hmm. Liberia. Now, when we look at the EFF stance on United Africa, one currency, one president, given the, recep uh, the reception that the, e the, the CIC gets when it travels the world, in fact, Africa, do you think uh, Africa is coming together to the realization that Africa is better united and without uh, these imposed uh, uh, borders? I think it's a very divided continent mm -hmm. and I think a lot of the African leaders are mere puppets of Europe. I mean, even our own president. I mean, what I find remarkable is in all these years, he's never gone to pay his respects to the widows of Marikana. But when some random queen in the UK, oh, UK. Yeah, yeah. dies, mm -hmm. Queen Elizabeth also, mm -hmm. Um, you know, he went to pay his respects, mm -hmm. That, as did many other African leaders. It mm -hmm. just speaks to the fact that South Africa remains a colony and our leaders uh, in South Africa and beyond in Africa mm -hmm. uh, just want to keep impressing uh, Western leaders. So I think we have a very poor uh, representation of genuine African leaders because, as we know, most of them are – the good ones are usually assassinated – the ones oh, that yes. speak to true mm -hmm. black consciousness and pan-Africanism, mm -hmm. like Steve Biko. Mm -hmm. He was, to me, the greatest leader mm -hmm. we ever had mm -hmm. in this country. Muammar Gaddafi as well. Exactly, and mm -hmm. the Thomas Sankaras. But yes. what we do see, and it's encouraging, mm -hmm. is we're seeing some young leaders in Burkina Faso and, and uh, a few countries mm -hmm. saying enough is enough. Mm -hmm. We are not going to be ruled by mm -hmm. some old Westerners who are beholden to a colonial agenda. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think there's great hope. Mm -hmm. And I think EFF is going to be part of that consortium of great new African formations mm -hmm. that are challenging the past and reimagining a future that has nothing to do with Western powers, whiteness, um, being subservient, subservient to the West. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of hope. Whether we see it right now, I'm not sure. I think it's going to take some time because I think it was Thomas Sankara always said the germs of imperialism are with us. Yes. And I think that still has to be mm -hmm. um, expelled from not only the, the, econo the, the economy or the land, mm -hmm. but from the very minds of people, especially older um, Africans who've been so damaged, I think, mm -hmm. by apartheid and colonial dogma mm -hmm. that they actually do believe that they're less Mm -hmm. And as I said earlier, luckily the EFF and other young formations are challenging uh, that dreadful propaganda of, um, of whiteness. Mm -hmm. And you served in the EFF. Why did you live? <laughs> I think there were, there were a lot of uh, reasons. I mean, I was elected as the first deputy secretary of Gauteng. Mm -hmm. And at first I felt so honored and excited and like acknowledged, and then I looked around and I thought, mm -hmm. what is a white person doing in a black struggle actually? Okay. And around me I saw many, many more capable young black women and men who could have done my job much better. So I think it was a learning experience for me that I wanted to step back from a leadership position because I don't believe, I don't even believe necessarily in white people in black organizations because a lot of them have done more harm than good. We see the ANC, I think, infiltrated by a lot of white liberals. Um, so that was one of the reasons I think I stepped back. But there was also, at that time, the organization was young. Um, I was unhappy with some of the decisions that the party made. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe, for instance, that the party would ever go into some kind of coalition or perhaps not call it agreement with the DA on mm -hmm. the metros. Mm -hmm. I was outraged, actually, mm -hmm. that what I thought my vote for the EFF was mm -hmm. to, was given to a white party. Mm 
Mm-hmm. But I have reflected on that, and that was five years ago. Mm-hmm. I think in retrospect, I understand the strategy of mm-hmm. the EFF, mm-hmm. and I support it now. So I think I was prob- I probably made mistakes mm-hmm. by judging the EFF at that time. I think they've done extremely well. Mm-hmm. I also see how they used mm-hmm. uh, their role in metros mm-hmm. to promote pro-black agendas, mm-hmm. to bring in insourcing mm-hmm. to, yes, you know, to all of that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I, 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 left, I left the EFF. Um, I was one of the people. I never spoke badly about the EFF. Mm-hmm. I have such respect and regard for the party. Mm-hmm. And um, to me, the, pers- the kind of person I revere most is mm-hmm. the EFF fighter on the ground because mm-hmm. there's nothing more special than that. Um, mm-hmm. And... I think reflecting on your 10 years, I think mm-hmm. the party has grown beyond any expectation. Mm-hmm. And although at the time I didn't agree with the decisions, I think if I look back now, I see that sometimes we put in leadership for a reason because they're visionary, they look mm-hmm. ahead. Mm-hmm. So as an ordinary member, I couldn't perhaps see mm-hmm. where Julius Malema was taking the party at that time. Mm-hmm. But now, reflecting back five years later, I do. Mm-hmm. I think the party is very, very strong, and uh, I think it's going to do very well yeah. in the elections. And I think it's ready to govern. I think in the areas that it's participated in, it's done extraordinarily well. Mm-hmm. So I, I think South Africans can look forward to a different paradigm yeah. of government. Yeah, because what I understand the EFF to be is a political party that represents the poor and the marginalized. As long as the interest of the poor and the marginalized is represented, the EFF is fine because the EFF is not power hungry. And I remember that type of agreement when the uh, EFF voted for the DA in Joburg at the time because the objective was to ensure that this insourcing and the former uh, DA uh, mayor, uh, Herman Mashaba, confessed to say if it wasn't for the EFF, well, in sourcing was, was was not going to be a, a reality in that part of uh, the the city in Johannesburg. Now, that is the nature and the character of the EFF. It doesn't put itself first. It puts the interest of the people first. So as long as you are going to implement uh, the cardinal pillars of the EFF, then it's fine. But what is important is that the voters must make a, a decisive decision. But if the people step back and not participate in the electoral system, that's what creates uh, these kind of problems because the EFF may not have the the power to necessarily, you know, take over and uh, preside over some decisions. But, well, I guess that is the character of the EFF. And now I, I understand that you regret some of the decision because perhaps you didn't understand the super logic at the time. <laughs> well, I, you yeah. know, I think that um, the EFF also is a learning organization. It's mm-hmm. certainly done better ideologically mm-hmm. than I thought. Mm-hmm. Certainly coupling with the DA or the current parties mm-hmm. in any way to me is not optimal. Mm-hmm. But I think it was a tactical decision. What I would like to see it doing now is to form coalitions or partnerships or alliances mm-hmm. with the pan-Africanist black parties. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where the future lies. So I'm encouraged to see like some s- talks with the PAC and, mm-hmm. and other organizations. ATM, I don't know what's happening. Mm-hmm. The newly formed MK party I think is mm-hmm. an interesting thing. Mm-hmm. I hope they work with EFF rather than trying to um, save the NC, which is an unworthy and impossible task. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think there's enough potential on mm-hmm. the left of the NC mm-hmm. um, to do something really magical in this country. And mm-hmm. I do believe that EFF has shown its leadership in that regard, mm-hmm. and I hope other parties get behind it mm-hmm. um, in creating a... Um, a 2024 that is yes. a 1994. Yeah, our 2024 is our 1994 indeed. So, looking at the 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 political landscape in South Africa, what do you think is the type of government that South Africans deserve? Now we are gravitating towards the 20, 2024. 
uh, elections, national and provincial elections. What type of government do you think South Africans deserve and do you think these elections will usher in such government? Well, I hope people vote wisely. I mm. still worry that the NC could come in with enough votes, either alone or with the um, their fellow bedmates, the DA. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, that's a match made in heaven and they belong together, And um, but they could still take power and that would be very unfortunate. That's why I was saying a moment ago to encourage a black formation, a truly black formation of parties mm -hmm. would be very powerful. But I think it's all about reimagining the future, perhaps something to influence by the work of Thomas, Thomas Ankara, mm -hmm. where he said, we must dare to create a future. And I think EFF has done that brilliantly. Mm -hmm. It's set a new way. I mean, the seven cardinal pillars mm -hmm. are revolutionary. It will mm -hmm. completely transform the way South Africa lives, breathes, uh, does business, um, raises its children. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we need, a totally different paradigm mm -hmm. where the apartheid infrastructure is completely broken down, mm -hmm. where the schooling system and the judicial system go back to indigenous ways of knowledge and being mm -hmm. rather than being subjected to the agenda of the white man. And in tr real terms, what I find very depressing mm -hmm. is that the ANC government, which we call a once upon a time liberation party, mm -hmm. has not only failed to bring about liberation, mm -hmm. but they failed to bring about basic services to their people. I oh, mean, yes, absolutely. to think that 30 years later, uh, black people in the country are fighting for basic rights to, you know, access to water, mm -hmm. to electricity. Mm -hmm. And it's all because there's been no shift to the infrastructure. And until that is changed, nothing will be better. Mm -hmm. And so I think it would have to be a complete rethinking mm -hmm. of how we do business. Self-sufficiency to me is a very important thing that we don't always, um, rely on the West. I think that's such a bad model of oh, being. Yes. And I mean, even I remember when, when I was at EFF before, I had proposed that even berets and your merchandise, mm -hmm. you know, that should be produced here, oh, yes. be an example. Because if we think about economic emancipation mm -hmm. and freedom, we, we think automatically about EFF. Mm -hmm. So I would also like to see it uh, producing great industries here uh, that we produce our own things and that hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. And until we actually come out from the enslavement mm -hmm. of the West, mm -hmm. I think no government is going to be a government that is for the people because we always are serving the white master internationally. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that has to shift. It has to be a mind shift. Mm -hmm from um, relying on others mm -hmm. to one of self-determination yeah. and pride and confidence. Yeah. And I think that's that's in play. And I think the EFF is embodying a lot of those things mm -hmm. through its seven cardinal pillars, mm -hmm. the, the primary, the, the principal one being land mm -hmm. return, mm -hmm. because without land, there's no freedom. Mm -hmm. So you strongly believe that the EFF is a viable alternative political home? political party of choice for South Africans? I think at the moment it is the only party that can take South Africa forward in a completely different way and in a very good way. And we see the councillors, we see the MMCs doing an outstanding job where mm -hmm. the NC hasn't managed to do work for decades. We see your very competent MMCs coming in, in Karteng and, and in other places, and just being very action-focused. But I also think it's a, a party that cares for people. Mm -hmm. And I would like to perhaps just give an example of when I was in the EFF working in Alex. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a – the story always uh, stays with me. And mm -hmm. I actually want to write about it in my upcoming book. And we were – we got a call from one of the conveners of one of the wards. And they said there, there was a terrible shack fire mm -hmm. on the outskirts of Alex. And could we all come in and help? Mm -hmm. And when we got there in the morning, it was a few hours afterwards, you could still um, see the, you know, a little bit of the, the burning and yeah. there was a smell of such destruction. Almost you could smell human bodies being burnt mm -hmm. and a whole lot of communities, uh, people in the community had mm -hmm. passed away through the fire. 
mm-hmm. and it was the most terrible scene. You know, even as I speak about it, I get emotional. And we, EFF and Alex, and we got together and we worked with a family. Mm-hmm. And when we asked why the ANC didn't help, mm-hmm. they, they said, no, they're not going to help because they think the family is Zimbabwean and they don't, they're not going to assist. Um, that was the allegation anyway. Mm-hmm. But the whole of... Self-hate. The, is, exactly. Yeah. And that's really mm-hmm. an issue. But what happened was that over the next few days, we all mm-hmm. took what we could. Um, we took curtains out of our houses. We found clothes for the family. We made sure that there was a dignified burial. And I remember saying to one of the conveners and Alex, mm-hmm. are these people even EFF members or participants? He said, no, mm-hmm. they're just human beings and we will look after them. Mm-hmm. And that story... St- has always stayed with me because it shows the humanity of EFF fighters, Mm -hmm. that their first instinct wasn't to say, are you South African? Are you Zimbabwean? Are you from Israel? Are you from the UK? They saw a family in great distress and they helped them. And I think that's a mark of leadership that we will see from EFF. And you can't buy that type of leadership. That comes from the heart. It comes from fighters and leaders Mm-hmm. who truly care about the plight of the people. Mm-hmm. But you raised the issue of self-hate, and I think that's such a pandemic. I think it really is, and hopefully a new government will deal with that uh, by by changing the cultural landscape and mm-hmm. honouring black knowledge systems, stopping de mm-hmm. from being articulated in its current form, putting African languages first and foremost in all the schools, um, those things will make a fundamental difference to the cultural framework and the viability and prosperity of black life um, and uh, future generations of black children. That's the way to go. And I do think EFF can do that. The Mm -hmm. one thing I believe that EFF should move away from is the support of the Freedom Charter, Mm -hmm. which as you spoke earlier about the constitution changing. Mm -hmm. And the constitution is based on the Freedom Charter, Mm -hmm. which is no Freedom Charter at all. In fact, it was drafted largely by white people and it reflects their interests. Mm -hmm. And it works on the false um, uh, view of that there's a just and equitable society. It still allows whites, the former oppressors, to have a large say over uh, many things, including land, the judiciary, Mm -hmm. and many things. That needs to change. And it's always surprising that we have a constitution that is lauded across the world, but has done little to affect the day-to-day conditions of the black child. Mm -hmm. And you think the ruling party is allowing that to happen? It's not, in fact, playing an effective role in amending the constitution in favor of the, the oppressed? Well, you know, I think the ANC of 1994, mm-hmm. I'm not hugely critical of it because I think they tried, but they were, the balance of forces wasn't correct. Okay. The ANC had come in as a tired organization, mm-hmm. probably with less uh, power than they than we were made to believe through the propaganda. Mm-hmm. The Afrikaners, white people know how to hold on to power. Mm. And... Um, I think they maintained that. Unfortunately, the ANC gave in on critical things like nationalization, which luckily now the EFF is pushing. And um, but I think the the ANC of today has become increasingly a party of white people. Mm. And uh, I think I've written that I think actually the ANC is quite scared of white people. Mm. And uh, I've made a forecast that they'll never touch whiteness. They'll never touch white land. Yeah because they do, they're timid uh, mm-hmm. against against that. And certainly with the president we have at the moment, President Ramaphosa, mm-hmm. he seems to really like white people and uh, he's certainly serving the interest mm-hmm. quite well. So I think the antidote for that is an organization like EFF who will shift completely the real levers of society, the economic levers and the cultural supremacy Mm-hmm. That I mean, it's crazy. I mean, like white people like me, what percentage of the population oh, do we yeah, command? Yeah, but we yeah. we actually still in Only control. The means of production. Exactly, and mm-hmm. we're still in control of everything. The narrative, the exactly oh, as you yeah, say, the, the means media. of produ- yeah, production. Yeah. 
and the media. And yeah. I mean, it goes back to a quote that Steve mm. Biko said. He says, black people must stop being pawns in a white man's game. Mm. And the game at the moment in South Africa is still a white man's game that has to change. And I do trust that EFF will fundamentally shift that. Yeah. And now from the Western Cape High Court, we understand mm -hmm. that our application to overturn the suspension of six EFF MPs, including the CIC, uh, was uh, dismissed. Uh, do you think that ruling is fair and what are the implications of that ruling? Well, uh, you know, I think we're seeing in South Africa the increasing mm -hmm. um, symptoms of a fascist state. And uh, if I was a president, I certainly wouldn't want... Um, Julius Malema and the leadership in mm -hmm. the state of the nation because we have to think what has this man got to say anyway mm -hmm. and uh, I think uh, he's been shamed and embarrassed by the party for so many mm -hmm. years rightfully so mm -hmm. but the courts you know are they seem many of them seem to be um, beholden to the ruling party rather than the the tenants of justice so we do see the courts unfortunately siding often Mm -hmm. with the powers that be mm -hmm. rather than the people. So I think it's unfortunate, but it will be a state of the nation that no one will, no one will really be wor watching. Mm -hmm. I, I, I assume uh, the party will be releasing the true state of the nation. Of course. Shortly. The EFF in parliament uh, over the past uh, 10 years, obviously it has changed the political landscape in South Africa, but most notably in parliament, uh, more people got interested in uh, the proceedings because of the EFF. In your view, as a political commentator, what are some of the key observations that you have made from the EFF side in as far as their radical approach or radical changes uh, is concerned or achievements for that matter? Well, first and foremost, we mm -hmm. must put the issue of land mm -hmm. down. I think that's the greatest achievement mm -hmm. to put it center stage where it had been marginalized as an issue mm -hmm. by the ANC. I also think um, there's been a lot of really brilliant people speaking. I think it's given the young generation confidence mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in um, politicians. Um, I think the discussion that the EFF has introduced has often been very robust and um, intellectually superior mm -hmm. to what we they had been seeing from the ANC for so long. Mm -hmm. I think the strong female voices from the EFF mm -hmm. on critical social and cultural issues and issues of gender-based violence and crime and social issues has been very profound. I think that's helped to shape the agenda mm -hmm. of South Africa and just even the presence of young people mm -hmm. in a very old uh, parliament I think has been a refreshment of uh, of the very concept of, of parliament. But I think what the EFF has done very well is that it has served in parliament but it has continued to serve the people in um, in all its communities. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the magic formula for a political party to mm -hmm. be strong on the ground, mm -hmm. but also use its forums within parliament and other uh, social and um, governmental settings mm -hmm. to showcase the work that it's done. I think it's it's got a very good balance mm -hmm. of both of those elements. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I want us to look at the South African politics uh, retrospectively, looking at the... Uh, Mandela, Mbeki, uh, Zuma and Ramaphosa administrations. Who is the worst president in your view? <laughs> well, that's not hard. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't have to like sit here and speculate for ages. Sure. No, by far, Sir Ramaphosa is the worst president. And actually I said it many, many years ago, about mm -hmm. six years ago before he even came into power. Mm -hmm. And I said, I may be wrong, let me not judge him, but let's see what he achieves. And he's achieved nothing, actually. Mm -hmm. I was going to be rude for a moment, but he really <laughs> has not achieved anything. Yeah. And by far, he is the worst president. Um, I, I think the only positive thing he's done in his five years reign is to actually stand for Palestine. Mm -hmm. But in his own country, he's done Dololo. Dololo. I was going to use another <laughs> EFF phrase, but yes, thank you for for uh, the Dololo yeah. phrase, yes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the best ever president that South Africa has ever had? 
in your view? I think we were robbed of of a good president because I think the caliber of NC leaders has been very poor. Mm -hmm. So you have to think about, I always try and imagine what South Africa would have been like if we had Steve Biko as oh. the president mm -hmm. um, of the NC <clears throat> leadership. I think that we were also deprived of the leadership of Chris Harney, mm -hmm. who could have been, I think, the, a, a better uh, NC president. Mm -hmm. I think of the presidents that have been in play so far, mm -hmm. and none of them to me are spectacularly good presidents. I think Jacob Zuma did better than the others. I mm -hmm. think he um, moved the compass, the needle, a little bit more towards mm -hmm. um, blackness, away from being told mm -hmm. uh, what to do by white masters. Um, but I, I don't have great respect for most of the NC leaders that have come. I, I think they have been sucked into a system of whiteness. None of them have really shifted uh, the landscape enough. Mm -hmm. Jacob Zuma to some extent, and perhaps that's one of the reasons mm -hmm. that he was removed because he was challenging the underbelly mm. of white control. Mm. Yeah, he was refusing white sup supremacy whenever it raises his ugly head. Yes, I don't think that he was. Uh, yeah. He was under the the boot of uh, white supremacy as much as the others were. I think Nelson Mandela mm -hmm. was. Um, I think he he was genuinely mm -hmm. caring about the people of South Africa, mm -hmm. but um, I think he compromised mm -hmm. too much. Probably not through a fault of his own, but because of the balance of forces. Mm -hmm at the time and uh Tama Becky I I I've never rated very very highly an intelligent man but I think he didn't deliver mm -hmm. much to the ordinary people mm -hmm. of South Africa. Mm -hmm. Now let's dissect the contents of your book uh black politics and white power in South Africa no white lies. What motivated uh this book and what did you seek to achieve by writing this book? Well, the, the book is um, it's really a compilation of some columns that I've written for mm -hmm. various newspapers mm -hmm. on the issue of uh, mm -hmm. the need for land return, mm -hmm. the, um, the lack of change in the Rainbow Nation. Mm -hmm. So I deal with quite critical themes, and I called it uh, No White Lies, mm -hmm. particularly because I think in this country we need to face inconvenient truths, that we don't have a democracy, that we don't have oh, yeah. equality. So I think the book is just a showcase of truths mm -hmm. that people don't want to face. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, it, it hasn't been necessarily very well received by the white community mm -hmm. because it implores them to, to gain a moral conscience and make reparations for apartheid, mm -hmm. which is still surprises me that the government has never requested mm -hmm. for reparations to be made mm -hmm. or that white people have never marched or marched for... Uh, justice or offered reparations. And in fact, I think a new government, uh, when the EFF comes into government, I think mm -hmm. it needs to look at the whole issue of reparations. Mm -hmm. I think it was um, uh, Zunele Manyi at one stage who spoke mm -hmm. about a white tax mm -hmm. to compensate uh, black families mm -hmm. for the horrors under apartheid. And I think those concepts need to come to the fore. Because what we have today is a, a no reconciliation. What's happened is that black people have simply been forced to reconcile with their poverty mm. and white people with their privilege. And arrogance. And arrogance, yeah. Mm. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's shameful. So, I mean, I speak here about how white people have gone out and spoken, get rid of Zuma, but they've never gone out and marched for return of land, like or apartheid, or mm -hmm. when there's been a, a black injustice or a terrible uh, tragedy in a black community, they're nowhere to be found. Mm -hmm. So it's really, uh, I think I uncover the lack of morality of white South Africans. And I don't exclude myself. You know, I believe in the Steve Biko speak of there is no better white person. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are all still... Um, the oppressing class. And, um, yeah, I think white people in this country don't appreciate the humanity of black people. 
mm-hmm. who haven't sought revenge, and they should have. Mm-hmm. Mm. And how is the book doing uh, in terms of sales? It's done. Uh, that was written. Um, it was written in, a, a few years ago. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm doing a follow up book on white supremacy, which will be released this year. The book did very well. I think the major bookstores weren't very happy to stock it, but it still landed up being on the exclusive book bestseller list. And I think that was mostly due to the support of many EFF people who mm-hmm. demanded the book from bookstores. Mm-hmm. And I think it shows also the power of the EFF is that they don't need the traditional media. Mm-hmm. They um, they can go out and demand, um, I want this book, I want the school to be yeah. changed, I want the sign to be mm-hmm. taken down. And people are forced to listen mm-hmm. to the voice of EFF. It's a very strong voice. And mm-hmm. yeah, I'm very grateful for the support that okay. I've had from so many fighters who've really supported the book. Thank mm-hmm. you. Yeah. And now let's look at the South Africa's uh, genocidal case against Israel. Uh, the International Court of Justice has uh, ruled in their favor, but the ruling, oh, the case itself, does not do much um, in terms of uh, efforts to, to talk about or to bring about ceasefire in Gaza. What do you think is South Africa's next step to ensure that there is, um, uh, or, or rather to ensure that Palestine is free and there's actually ceasefire in Gaza? Well, I think the South African government must be commended mm-hmm. for their strong action Mm-hmm. at the um, International Court of Justice. And mm-hmm. I think their presentation was very strong. Mm-hmm. And also the EFF was very vocal on mm-hmm. some boycotts and yes. also ensuring that the embassy was closed or mm-hmm. in the process of being closed. So just to commend both parties for that strong stance. Mm-hmm. I think South Africa at the moment has done all that it really can mm-hmm. because it's um, appealed both to the ICC and the International Court of Justice. I think um, what it can do now perhaps is lobby its BRICS partners and some of its trade partners to take more decisive action against apartheid Israel. Mm -hmm. And um, the fact of uh, pushing economic sanctions and boycotts Mm -hmm. I think is very powerful because we see in our own history how economic sanctions and international uh, pressure Mm-hmm. actually assisted mm-hmm. uh, the transition to 1994. Mm-hmm. So I think that's probably the strongest thing that they can do. Unfortunately, we have a regime in Israel that doesn't seem to care much about mm-hmm. public opinion, mm-hmm. and they seem to be defying international law, not for the first time, I may add. So it's really a battle um, for humanity, mm-hmm. and uh, let's hope, South Africa and those that have stood for for the people of Palestine win. It's 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 a very critical battle. Um, I think it was always was it Malcolm X. I always tend to misquote famous people. Mm-hmm. Said you know justice wherever injustice is injustice is occurring, mm-hmm. um, we need to intervene. And yeah. I think it's it's very crucial. And I I've done quite a few interviews internationally on this, and mm-hmm. so many of the interviewers have spoken about Julius Malema and the great intervention of EFF in this. So whilst um, yes. it's been the South African government that's taken credit, mm-hmm. I think EFF has played a tremendous role in propelling actions oh, yes. against yes. Um, apartheid Israel. Yeah. And that, that should be recognized. Yeah, and we must commend the leadership of the EFF led by CAC Julius Malema because the boycotts, it was the EFF that were behind the boycotts that any Israeli products should be banned. If ever South Africa is trading with Israel, they should cut their ties. And that obviously is working in favor of ceasefire because if there isn't any international uh, support or trade that is supporting Israel, obviously it's likely to backtrack and obviously give up and ensure that there is, uh, pa- Palestine is freed. Certainly. Yeah. Now, the EFF will be launching the its manifesto in Durban. What are your expectations from the People's Manifesto? Well, I think it will be a continuation of the very effective policies that the party has championed mm-hmm. over the last um, 10 years. Mm-hmm. I think you're going to get a very positive reception 
uh, in KwaZulu Natal. I think it's a very highly contested area. Oh, it is. But I think EFF uh, is making some gains there, mm-hmm. and um, I think it will it will attract a lot of new voters in that that area. So I we expect well we know that EFF is always full stadiums. I don't always think that's a magic bullet, mm-hmm. but I think it's an opportunity to once again um, profile its very powerful and effective policy mm-hmm. framework. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what distinguishes the EFF from other parties. It's got a very clear uh, set of policies mm-hmm. um, that are not only ideologically solid and sober, but are very easy to action. Mm-hmm. Um, and to me, that's the um, the sign of a of a party that is taking itself seriously. I think if the manifesto or the 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 pillars of the EFF are implemented, mm-hmm. they're going to impact directly on the material well being oh. of ordinary South Africans. So it's a party that speaks very much to the to the ordinary person. Um, very resonant, I think, with the current mm-hmm. issues on the ground. Mm-hmm. So you strongly believe uh, that uh, in the notion that, uh, you know, political power without economic freedom is meaningless? Absolutely. I mean, we've seen that. We've lived that for 30 years Mm -hmm. where there's been no economic liberation. I mean, if we think about the ANC that was formed in the 1912, 1913, Mm -hmm. and the agenda was land, what it's become today is absolutely horrific because the share of land amongst black South Africans is so minuscule Mm -hmm. that you can see historically that the ANC has failed Mm -hmm. terribly. Mm -hmm. So economic emancipation, of course, is the answer. It is, I think, a mission that the EFF and other pan-Africanist black conscious organizations will drive through. Mm -hmm. And um, I I think the slogan of uh, 2008 24 being mm-hmm. our 1994 is absolutely apt because the generation of 1994 was deeply let down by the ANC. Mm. And I do believe that 2024 may be our last chance to rectify and get this country on the right path towards economic liberation. Mm-hmm. So I think EFF has got a, a, lo- a hard few months ahead of it. Mm-hmm. You're talking about the EFF, obviously, as a viable um, political party and the, you know, possibly the tool uh, or rather the weapon in the hands of the poor and would most likely and definitely usher in economic freedom. What do you make of uh, political parties, especially small political parties that are being formed ahead of the elections, including uh, independent uh, candidates who are vying for uh, positions of power? Actually, I'm so glad you asked me that question because I worry about this glut of political parties mm-hmm. that are suddenly coming to the fore. Mm-hmm. And we're going to have this extremely long ballot paper which actually goes against the less literate. And mm. I think that's by design. I believe that the great number of political parties isn't a sign of democracy. I think it's a sign of confusion, political confusion. And I also worry that there's going to be a lot of wasted votes on smaller parties, and that's going to favor the ANC. So I think a message to the electorate is to support a viable bigger party, such as the EFF, I'm not necessarily advocating the EFF, but, <laughs> but uh, the, the PAC, yeah. you know, a mm-hmm. strong black party. Mm-hmm. Because I think to, to, to vote for all these smaller parties, it's, it's just a wasted vote. They're not even going to come. I think they have to meet a threshold of 40,000 or oh, 50,000. Yeah. And those votes will be discarded. So the electorate must think very carefully. I also think that you also wonder, you know, Sora Maposa has been speaking about a secret weapon to mm-hmm. win the election. I don't know what that is. Mm. Um, but you wonder if a lot of these parties have been formed with the consent of the ANC to almost uh, distract from um, like bigger parties like the EFF because P- 
people are going to get so confused that mm-hmm. they might just vote for the ANC. It's just too much to go through. Oh, yes. And uh, so I think it's going to favor them. I think there are some interesting new formations, mostly to the, the right. Um, but I think the MK party is the one party I think is quite interesting. Mm-hmm. I think of all the new parties, that's the only one that I think could get a reasonable share. And hopefully they they take that from the ANC. Mm-hmm. Jacob Zuma, the former president of the ANC, has now uh, officially been suspended by the ANC. Uh, what impact will that suspension uh, have on either the ANC or the MK? Well, I think the party, first of all, the ANC was t- technically correct to sus- to suspend his membership. Mm-hmm. And Jacob Z- Zuma knew very well as he entered mm-hmm. um, the public arena and said, I'm voting for another party, mm-hmm. that he was violating the NC constitution. Mm-hmm. So the NC did the correct thing to suspend him on technical grounds. What I don't think they're going to do, and I think the more significant thing to expel him. Is to, exactly, yeah. is to expel him. Why are they not expelling him, by the way? I think it's too much of a risk for a number of reasons. Mm-hmm. I think that would create um, the ire of a lot of people. We we think that because Jacob Zuma has been removed from office, he's not powerful and he doesn't have a lot of support. I differ. I think he has a lot of support, not only in KwaZulu, but across the country. And uh, I think the NC is fully aware of that. Also, if he had to be expelled, it would raise issues of um, other candidates within the ANC, including the president, why he hasn't been expelled mm-hmm. for his parlor parlor matter. It raises a lot of questions about key leadership. The top seven would probably be all be implicated mm-hmm. in some issues about why they should be, mm-hmm. if not suspended, expelled. Mm-hmm. So I think it would open a can of worms. And I think mm-hmm. the ANC is being prudent by not expelling him. Mm-hmm. But I think by Jacob Zuma lending support uh, to the MK party, I think it has propelled them, pushed them into a space, a viable space. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think they they definitely will take a chunk out of the traditional NC base, I think beyond KwaZulu-Natal. Mm-hmm. And when given a platform, uh, President Ramaphosa always talk about the ANC uh, that is on a path of renewal and all of that, and that he uses that as uh, an excuse for wrongdoings. Uh, you cited the issue of Pala Pala, but you would say, we have dealt with state capture, we have done this and that. Do you think the ANC is on a path of renewal in the sense that the people of South Africa should be or can be fooled by that narrative? No, I think actually renewal is very much the same as the reconciliation in 1994. It's mm-hmm. a myth. It's a mirage. It doesn't exist. There's mm-hmm. no sign of a renewal. I was, I think in the media yesterday, they were saying the levels of corruption in South Africa are higher mm-hmm. than they've ever been. Mm-hmm. If we look at the top leadership of the NC, they all seem implicated, corrupt, mm-hmm. tainted. Um, I think the lack of integrity of the leadership mm-hmm. is obvious for anyone to see, mm-hmm. um, whether you're educated or not educated. It's mm-hmm. visible everywhere. Mm-hmm. This concept of renewal is just a concept. It's They should not uh, – the, the, actually, the word renewal shouldn't be in the the dictionary of the ANC. It doesn't exist. Mm. Which political party will you vote for and why? <laughs> <laughs> It shouldn't be a difficult one, this one. <laughs> yeah, I think that um, I think my li- my vote is likely to go to the EFF. Uh, it will certainly go to a pan-Africanist party, mm-hmm. uh, but in most likelihood, the EFF. I genuinely do believe that um, the party will make a big difference mm-hmm. to my local area and uh, on a national and provincial basis. Mm-hmm. I think what... I, I can say that perhaps with more conviction than a lot of other people because I've worked with so many people in the leadership mm-hmm. and I've seen what they can do. So I'm not just speaking um, as an excited activist. I'm speaking as somebody who's seen firsthand what the EFF can do mm-hmm. uh, of their commitment 
and I followed the track record of their co-governance. And I, it's very, it's very, very impressive. Mm -hmm. So I think the EFF is the party to vote for. Mm -hmm. um, I do hope there's a block of pan-Africanist black parties that get behind it mm -hmm. because I don't think the EFF can do it alone. Mm -hmm. I think they need to col collaborate. I've mentioned the MK party a few times. I would really like some cooperation between the two parties. I think that would be very powerful. Mm -hmm. On a lighter note, your message to South Africans? My message to the Africans, mm -hmm. well, what I would say, I don't know if it's on a lighter note, but <laughs> <laughs> I would say that, you know, we can't keep blaming the government mm -hmm. actually for everything. The power is in your hands. If you vote the NC government in this year, mm -hmm. then um, you deserve the government you get. Mm -hmm. And I have no sympathy. Mm -hmm. So I say ahead of, well, elections, the, the, the registration weekend mm -hmm. is go out, register, vote for, if not the EFF, a party that puts Africans first. This is an African country mm -hmm. and um, the rights of the black child have been dismissed and degradate, degradated for, see, I can't speak English now, <laughs> <laughs> have been, have been yeah. um, really disregarded mm -hmm. uh, by the white governments and now a new black government. Mm -hmm. So the time, the time is now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think South Africa is more in, in a position to have, uh, you know, a coalition government if we can't, if the EFF cannot uh, secure, uh, you know, a total victory? Do you think South Africa would... Um, be a better country in a coalition government, given its uh, instabilities? Well, I think that we've seen across the country that coalition governments have fractured mm -hmm. um, provinces. So on a national basis, I don't think they're going to work. I think if there's a, co a coalition between the DA and the ANC, that probably will just cement white interests and then the country is really effectively lost. Mm. The only coalition that I think should work would be uh, a coalition of black parties, genuine black parties. And I really, I really, I'm not a praying person, but I really mm -hmm. pray for that. I think that is the yeah. only way out mm -hmm. of this rainbow nation that has mm -hmm. just been such a disservice mm -hmm. to black South Africans. Mm -hmm. No, thank you very much, Kim, for making time for us here on the podcast. We really appreciate it. I hope South Africans have heard that they will reap what they sow. So indeed, they should just uh, register to vote and usher in, uh, obviously, an EFF uh, government. Thank you very much for making time. Thank you so much for a lovely interview. It's been a privilege. Pleasure. Now we have come to the end of today's episode, ladies and gentlemen. Please remember to subscribe to the EFF YouTube channel for all the latest uh, episodes on the EFF uh, podcast. My name is Titus Tungu. Until we meet again, good get Kanimamba. Stand up, South Africa. Make sure that South Africa, you are counted with me. Run, South Africa. Stand and make sure that our people understand that the need to be revolution in South Africa is guaranteed that under the EFF, this country will be the better. EFF is a covert thing.